Adventist Pioneer Library presents Lest We Forget, Volume 1, Number 1. We have nothing to fear for the future except as we shall forget the way the Lord has led us and His teaching in our past history. This from Ellen White in Life Sketches, page 196. To give you a brief overview of what you will hear in this first issue, we'll begin with an article by Fred Bischoff entitled The Importance of the Pioneers, followed by a brief account of Pioneer Wives by Joy Radzik and Francis Foster. Then we will hear part one of a two-part article written by Ray Foster entitled Seekers of His Glory, and we will finish with an overview timeline of events leading up to the disappointment in 1844 and a few years following. This issue shows the time frame and relevance of the pioneers of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. This topic will be continued in the following issues, and the next issue of which is devoted to the importance of the life and work of William Miller. The Importance of the Pioneers by Fred Bischoff We are living in a time when foundations are being tested. Every wind of doctrine is testing us to see upon what we are established. When the wind turns into a flood, it will be shown in a final way whether we have built on the rock or on the earth without foundation. Scripture tells us that the rock we need is Jesus Christ. Built on Him, we are secure. We need then to know Him, but the stability of the person of Christ is fully seen only with an understanding of His sayings, which He personified the foundation principles of the Christian Church. So this person and His principles are inseparable, both being dimensions of the whole being that He is. It is in this way that we are told both to build on Christ and to build on His teachings. Christ, in His wisdom, shared that founding position which He had as the chief cornerstone, and upon which He built His church with other godly men, the apostles and prophets. The apostles were those who met two criteria. First, they must have seen Christ, not just casually or figuratively, but deeply and in a literal way. It was thus that Paul could claim to be an apostle, though not numbered among the twelve. They were eyewitnesses in a special sense. Secondly, as the word implies, they also were commissioned in a special way to go and tell what they had seen. The prophets were individuals who, in a similar special way, were spokespersons for God, sent with messages to those who believe, those who had accepted the gospel that the apostles preached. So it was the ministry of these first apostles, second prophets, duplicating the ministry of Christ, that demonstrated their position as co-founders of that which Christ was building upon himself and them. A parallel process was seen in the establishing of the Seventh-day Adventist Church out of the Advent awakening of the early 1800s. There were godly men and women who, by faith, saw that God was leading them in spite of the disappointment they had experienced, who were eyewitnesses of the genuineness of the work that the Lord had wrought from the beginning of the movement. Out of the large group professing a belief in the second coming of Christ, this remnant came, little companies of seekers after truth, who searched the Scriptures as for hidden treasure, looking beyond the foundation truths of Christianity to find the foundation truths for the last days. Out of these came those who are identified as pioneers in our work, or, as we like to call them, apostles of the Advent. It is of interest and importance to note that she whom the Lord chose as a messenger did not contribute of herself to this process of discovering the pillars of present truth for our time, she relates that she could not understand the reasoning of the brethren, that her mind was locked, but that when the others in their search for truth came to the point in their study when they said, We can do nothing more, the Spirit of the Lord would come upon me. 
I would be taken off in vision, and a clear explanation of the passages we had been studying would be given me. The Lord did this to confirm His order of using first apostles in laying down truth, and second prophets to confirm and instruct in the process. Of what importance, then, are these first apostles of Seventh-day Adventism? We have the words of the messenger easily available to us, for which we must ever thank God. But how important is what the apostles of the Advent left for us? The messenger tells us how God feels about this question. We are to repeat the words of the pioneers in our work, who knew what it cost to search for the truth as for hidden treasure, and who labored to lay the foundation of our work. They moved forward step by step under the influence of the Spirit of God. Let that which these men have written in the past be reproduced. The prophets confirm the words of the apostles. We hear God calling us all to complete the affirmation of this dimension of our foundations by doing what was stated, repeat the words of the pioneers. Let us rise and reactivate their voice, for the storm is rising that will sorely test our establishment upon the truth they uncovered. Pioneer Wives by Joy Radzik and Francis Foster We do not read a lot about the wives of the pioneers and the women who were connected with the Millerite movement and the early years of Adventism. However, these women had heavy responsibilities, and quietly and without fanfare, carried on their work in the home and family, and wherever the Lord opened avenues of service. The reminiscences of Mrs. Jenny Ayres Kellogg, in her account of Growing Up with the Third Angel's Message, give us a glimpse into the lives of these courageous distaff pioneers. Jenny's father, Haziel Manning Ayers, married one of four daughters of a Mr. Stanbrow of New York. Mr. Stanbrow's first wife, and mother of two of his daughters, was a Seventh-day Baptist, and had instructed her children in her religious beliefs before her death. Each of the four daughters married a Seventh-day Baptist young man. Eventually, Mr. Stanbrow persuaded three of his sons-in-law to give up what he termed this queer Seventh-day religion. However, Ginny's mother and father refused to give up their faith. Mr. Stanbrow threatened to remember this when I make up my will. But Mrs. Ayers declared she would rather do right and lose a large inheritance. She held the truth of the Seventh-day Sabbath to be a more precious inheritance than her father's property. It was no less difficult in those days to give up the material security and physical comfort that a sizable inheritance would have afforded, and certainly there was no less intolerance of religious beliefs that did not conform to the popular theology of the day. But we praise God that Mrs. Ayers with her husband, and in concert with many other stalwart young pioneers, chose to walk in the light of truth. In place of her share in her father's wealth, Ginny's mother chose instead the pearl of great price. Jenny also recalled her marriage to Alonzo Kellogg, and the practice in those early years of Adventism of holding meetings and Sabbath services in various homes. It was customary for the wives to make the communion bread and prepare the wine. Sometimes, when they could not get grapes, they would use raisins. In every instance, it was the women who made it possible for the believers to gather together in fellowship and to hold meetings and worship services in their homes. With ready and willing hearts and hands, they extended hospitality to friends and strangers alike, opening their hearts to God's message and their homes to God's messengers. Our pioneer women made their hearts and homes places of worship. Now we will hear from Ray Foster in part one of his article, The Seventh-day Adventist Pioneers, entitled Seekers of His Glory. God has a purpose, an agenda for every age. The agenda 
for the last generation is the most glorious, for it is written, God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. Hebrews 11 verse 40. The agenda for the last generation completes the work of all generations of all time. The mystery of God is to be finished in the last generation. Revelation 10 verse 7 states, But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God shall be finished, as he hath declared to his servants the prophets. The church is involved with the finishing of this mystery. Ephesians 3 verses 9 through 12 state, And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ, to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God, according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him. It is important that we know God has an agenda for the end-time remnant church. Unless we know the agenda God has for us, how can we cooperate? How can we know unless God tells us? We must be listening and searching to know God's will and ways to hear God's agenda for us. The experience of those who first searched and found the understanding of God's end-time agenda for His church, is thrilling indeed. We today not only need to know what these Seventh-day Adventist pioneers knew, but we need to progress in the knowledge and experience of God's end-time agenda for His church. Who are the Seventh-day Adventist pioneers? The time of the end began when the deadly wound was inflicted on one of the heads of the seven-headed beast of Revelation 13. And I stood upon the sand of the sea, and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wandered after the beast. Revelation 13, verses 1 through 3. All the world is still wandering after the beast. That deadly wound was given when the French general Berthier took the Pope of Rome captive in 1798. This event ended the dark ages of papal persecution and prepared the way for final development on earth of God's remnant church of Revelation 10. And the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth lifted up his hand to heaven and swear by him that liveth forever and ever that there should be time no longer. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished, as he hath declared to his servants the prophets. And the voice which I heard from heaven spake unto me again, and said, Go, and take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel which standeth upon the sea and upon the earth. And I went unto the angel, and said unto him, Give me the little book. And he said unto me, Take it, and eat it up and it shall make thy belly bitter, but it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. Revelation 10, verses 5 through 9. The worldwide movement in fulfillment of this prophecy took place in the early 1800s. It was a bitter disappointment when Christ was expected to return to earth on October 22, 1844, but did not. Who were those involved in the fulfillment of this prophecy, and what was their experience? These are important questions because they relate to the finishing of the mystery of God in and through His Church, so that principalities and powers in heavenly places might know the manifest wisdom of God. We'll take up part two of this article in our next issue. Next, 
we will follow a timeline of events that we hope will be helpful that lead up to the great events of 1844 and just beyond. This timeline was put together by Arthur Mallon and is entitled See Jehovah's Stately Steppings in the Sands of Time. The Pioneers, the Three Angels' Messages, the Doctrines, the Prophecies, and the Prophetic Gift. We begin with three events that took place in the earth and in the heavens that marked the period of time known as the time of the end, and was, we believe, a direct fulfillment of the prophecy of Jesus given in Matthew 24, verse 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. In 1755, there was the great Lisbon earthquake that was felt over 25% of the earth's surface. That was followed in 1780 by the dark day and that evening the moon turning blood red. 1798 brought us to the end of the 1260-year prophecy. In 1831, William Miller began to speak and publish on the first angel's message and the fulfillment of the 2300-year prophecy announcing the second advent. In 1833, we had the final celestial event of the falling of the stars predicted by Jesus in Matthew 24, verse 29. That was followed in 1838 with Josiah Litch, who wrote on the seven trumpets of Revelation and set a date for the sixth trumpet as the fall of the Ottoman Empire on August 11, 1840. In 1840, Joshua Himes published The Signs of the Times and united with William Miller, going from city to city. The fall of the Ottoman Empire on August 11 demonstrated the day-for-a-year principle and many believers joined the Advent movement. Hundreds of pastors joined Miller in preaching the prophecies of Christ's second coming. In 1842, following the council in Habakkuk 2, verses 2 and 3, Charles Fitch was encouraged to develop a chart showing the prophecies in Daniel and Revelation. William Foy was given two visions which he shared publicly until the autumn of 1844. And that leads us to several events taking place in 1844. On March the 12th, the first disappointment took place, and there was a tarrying time. Churches began to shut their doors to the message. Rachel Preston, a Seventh-day Baptist, moved to Washington, New Hampshire, and shared the Bible Sabbath with members of the Christian Church. An editorial in the Midnight Cry agitated on the obligation to keep the Sabbath. Frederick Wheeler began to keep the Sabbath. In July of 1844, the midnight cry began. There was heavy opposition to the first angel's message, and the second angel's message, Come out of her, my people, was given to separate a people out of the confused, creed-bound churches. At the Exeter camp meeting in August, S. S. Snow showed the tenth day of the seventh month, October 22, to be the end of the 2300 days prophecy. The cry went forth, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Also that year William Foy had a third vision, but when he saw the cost and sacrifice required, he ceased public speaking. Soon afterwards he sickened and died. In September, George Storrs published six sermons which explained the doctrine of the unconscious state of the dead. In early October, Hazen Foss was given on two separate occasions a vision showing the three steps to heaven, but he refused to communicate the vision. T. M. Preble began keeping the Bible Sabbath. That winter J. N. Loughborough heard and accepted the first angel's message. By this time there were 256,000 conversions in the United States of America between 1840 and 1844. All of this led up to what we have come to know in history as the Day of Great Disappointment, October 22, 1844, 
the day in which the pioneers expected the literal appearance of Jesus Christ to this earth, but he did not come. The next day, October 23, Hiram Edson received an insight that the sanctuary to be cleansed was in heaven. O. R. L. Crozier published the sanctuary doctrine in the day dawn early in 1845, and again in the February 7, 1846 issue of the Day Star. Between the disappointment and January 1845, some members of the Washington, New Hampshire Church, following the example of William Farnsworth, began keeping the Bible Sabbath. They formed the first group of Sabbatarian Adventists. In December of 1844, Miss Ellen Harmon received her first vision at the home of Mrs. Haynes. 1845, in the February 28 issue of The Hope of Israel, T. M. Preble published an essay calling the attention of the Advent body to the Sabbath and the fact that Christians were obliged to keep it. Joseph Bates studied with the Sabbath keepers in New Hampshire, was affirmed in the light, and began preaching the truth from state to state. He soon published a tract. In 1846, on a visit to New Bedford, Massachusetts, Miss Ellen Harmon became acquainted with Joseph Bates, who urged the importance of the Sabbath upon her and James White. They accepted his scriptural evidence, and shortly thereafter she was shown its importance in vision. In 1846, the third angel's message, connected with the first and second, began to be proclaimed. The Sabbath truth, connected with the Ark of God and the light on the sanctuary, confirmed that the Advent movement was ordained of God. Now the meaning of the three steps up on the pathway to the city of God was clear. In April of 1847, James White wrote, Since the seventh month of 1844, the third angel's message was, and still is, a warning to the saints to hold fast and not go back and receive the marks which the virgin band got rid of during the second angel's cry. And finally, in 1848, Seventh-day Adventists were learning that the Sabbath of the Fourth Commandment was the sign or seal of God, and that the time had arrived for the proclamation of the sealing message of Revelation 10, verses 1 through 4. We finish this first issue today with a message from Ellen White, recorded in Selected Messages, Volume 1, pages 206 and 207. Many of our people do not realize how firmly the foundation of our faith has been laid. My husband, Elder Joseph Bates, Father Pierce, Elder Hiram Edson, and others who were keen, noble, and true were among those who, after the passing of the time in 1844, searched for the truth as for hidden treasure. I met with them, and we studied and prayed earnestly. Often we remained together until late at night, and sometimes through the entire night, praying for light and studying the Word. Again and again these brethren came together to study the Bible in order that they might know its meaning and be prepared to teach it with power. When they came to the point in their study where they said, We can do nothing more, the Spirit of the Lord would come upon me. I would be taken off in vision, and a clear explanation of the passages we had been studying would be given me, with instruction as to how we were to labor and teach effectively. Thus light was given that helped us to understand the Scriptures in regard to Christ, His mission, and His priesthood. A line of truth extending from that time to the time when we shall enter the city of God was made plain to me, and I gave to others the instruction that the Lord had given me. During this whole time I could not understand the reasoning of the brethren. My mind was locked, as it were, and I could not comprehend the meaning of the scriptures we were studying. This was one of the greatest sorrows of my life. I was in this condition of mind until all the principal points of our faith were made clear to our minds in harmony with the Word of God. 
The brethren knew that when not in vision, I could not understand these matters, and they accepted as light direct from heaven the revelations given. For two or three years my mind continued to be locked to an understanding of the Scriptures. In the course of our labors, my husband and I visited Father Andrews, the father of J. N. Andrews, who was suffering intensely with inflammatory rheumatism. We prayed for him. I laid my hands on his head and said, Father Andrews, the Lord Jesus maketh thee whole. He was healed instantly. He got up and walked about the room, praising God and saying, I never saw it in this wise before. Angels of God are in this room. The glory of the Lord was revealed. Light seemed to shine all through the house, and an angel's hand was laid upon my head. From that time to this, I have been able to understand the Word of God.